The book of Deuteronomy has in it toward the end, after many laws have been expounded, laws that teach the people of God to be kind to the poor and to the stranger, to be honest, to be just in their dealings, to be merciful, and also some kind of strange laws about not mixing different fabrics or crops and things like that. Toward the end, after all these laws, there's blessings and there are curses. Curses that will befall those who don't follow God's way, but turn to the gods of the people of the land into which they are headed. A land, by the way, that they will take by force, but, you know, that's another story. The curses are myriad, and they include plagues and illnesses and exile and war. But also, and this is what I want to emphasize today, the, the, the curses declare that nature itself will turn against God's people if they cannot live as God intends them to live. Locusts and grubs will devour their crops. Olive trees will fall. Mildew will grow in their storehouses. The earth itself will dry up. And the rains will be locked away in the heavens. Now, one can take that kind of thing a lot of ways. Some people might dismiss it. Uh, some others might interpret it in different ways. And some, some of those interpretations, I think, are helpful, and others are not. I think it's less helpful to think of natural disasters as some kind of punishment for sin in a sort of one-to-one -one direct way, meaning, for instance, that God smites the sinner with a tornado or something like that. But I think you can think of this in a more helpful way. And to think of these sentiments expressed in Deuteronomy and other books as insights into the interconnectedness of all of creation, of life and land, human and non-human, the sea and the ships upon it, forests and rocks and wild animals, and the humans who gather the fruits. And of course, the interconnectedness of all of us, human and human. So our story today, though, is from Mark. And it comes toward the beginning of the gospel, right after Jesus is teaching the crowds. And he teaches the crowds in parables, he says. And then he takes the disciples aside and teaches them with explanation. Our story today is one of the first what we would call epiphanies of Jesus' divinity to the disciples. They remember they say, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey? And remember the story begins with the storm and wind arising. The word used there is whirlwind. Whirlwind. And it's the same word that is used when, remember, Elijah is taken up from Elisha. In the whirlwind. It's the same, same Greek word is used there. It's also the word, that whirlwind is the same whirlwind in, out of which God's word comes in answer to Job. So Jesus is asleep during this whirlwind. Not unlike perhaps the sleeping Jonah. And also not unlike some of the images that you find around the Near East at the time, sleeping gods. That sleep was not meant to signify indifference, but meant to signify Jesus' absolute peace and authority in the midst of chaos. Because the sea, when it churns, reminds us of chaos. The deep at the beginning of creation, in which God's word separated the waters above from the waters below, and which commanded the land to emerge from its midst, so that the sea was contained, so that the proud waves would be contained, according to God's answer to Job today. Now, the rest of the story is really about the disciples' fear and their cry to Jesus in the midst of a deadly storm in the midst of a deadly whirlwind, and in the midst of demonic chaos. I say demonic because you'll remember that Jesus rebukes the sea and the wind and silences them, just as Jesus will do in a passage later and has done before to the demons who possess and torment his people. 
it's clear that, that the sea for Mark, this sea is possessed until Jesus' word creates a Sabbath rest, a great calm, an order restored. So let's get back to something I mentioned at the beginning. The idea of God and God's power over nature as being not about sin and punishment in a direct way, but about our interconnectedness. How we treat each other is reflected in how we treat the natural world and vice versa. If we see the natural world as a thing to be exploited for our own uses, we will see others as things also to be exploited. If we relinquish our role as stewards and take instead the role of master, then we will see the natural world as something to be subjugated. And so also we will retreat, we will treat each other likewise. But the world, all of creation, people, trees, seas, they don't want to be enslaved or subjugated, abused or exploited. And so they protest and they rebel or they perish or dry up or swamp up and fill our boats and our beaches. That is the logic of the Bible anyway. This personification of the natural world as an actor among other actors like the sea in our reading was not something new to Mark's gospel. Herodotus, if you know him, he's a Greek historian, tells the story of the great emperor Xerxes whipping the river Bosporus. He sent his soldiers to go with actual whips and give the river 50 lashes because it was too dangerous to cross. And our psalm today says that those who went down to the sea to ply their, ship, their, ply their trade on their ships, to them God sends and also calms storms in response to their prayers. God is Lord of creation and can control its forces at will. And perhaps the, the, the Bible doesn't exactly personify nature in the way that Herodotus did. It certainly sees nature as sometimes an adversary, sometimes an ally of humankind and even of God. As we treat each other, we treat the earth. As we treat the earth, so it treats us. So today, Mark tells the story of this epiphany, a shining forth, Jesus as divine, rebuking the wind and the sea. But we cannot ever forget the arc of the gospel. Jesus will be condemned by the earthly powers to die on the cross. Jesus' divine power is ultimately and most importantly shown forth in his humility and his vulnerability. God is incarnate, does not clothe his divine power in the trappings of human power and human esteem. Rather, God befriends the poor and the outcast and defends them. God took the form of a slave, says Paul, and did not see power as something to be grasped at. And this God calls to his side those who are themselves vulnerable and calls them to feed the vulnerable. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit makes each of us, as the church, this people of God and the bearers of Christ to the world. Part of faith is to realize that the power that calms the raging seas and with it our fear and trembling is right here among us. And it becomes manifest in our willing to be people who try to be Christ to the world, who stand not against but with the weak, who struggle to love our enemies, and who invite those who are outcasts to our table. It is from that invitation and the courage and perseverance it implies that the true order and interconnectedness, the divine order of the world, emerges. It is in fragmentation and isolation and hate that signals the return of chaos. It is when we live our lives in a way that invites those who have been cast out, invites those back in, that we will bring the great calm, the great peace, the great Sabbath to earth. And so, as St. Paul exhorts us today, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Open wide your hearts. Amen.